Welcome everyone to the session, Harnessing AI and Data Analytics to Drive Value-Based Care. This session of the Value-Based Care Virtual Briefing is sponsored by IMO Health. I'm Angie Stewart, Content Strategist for Modern Healthcare Custom Media, and it is my pleasure to be moderating this session. I'd like to start off by thanking our sponsor, IMO Health, and I'd also like to thank our speakers for being here today. I'll go ahead and introduce you all. First, we have John Larson, Vice President of Commercialization for IMO Health. We're also joined by Lacey Heiberger, Chief of Practice Innovation at UVA Health. Next, we have Kate Armate, President and CEO for the Institute for Healthcare Improvement. And finally, we're excited to have Deepak Sadagopan, Chief Operating Officer of Population Health Management at Providence. Panelists, thanks so much for being here. Uh, we're really looking forward to this discussion and all the insights we're going to bring to our audience. I'm going to start with an opening question around the primary challenges and opportunities we're seeing. What are the really big uh, things there, challenges and opportunities facing healthcare systems as they continue this important transition to value-based care? I will go ahead and pick on Lacey first, and then we can kind of go around um, as you feel comfortable. Great, thank you so much for having me. Um, so I am a registered nurse and an MBA. I have worked as a clinician, as a consultant for a payer um, in policy and in administration. So the common thread of those being a passion for improving health outcomes and better experiences for our care teams by sort of creating supportive systems with things like good data infrastructure, efficiency and workflows, meaningful incentives and a collaborative culture. So I can I can touch on one of the issues that um, that I see here and I'm looking forward to hearing from the rest of the panelists. Um, one of them is that we have a huge amount of data in this space, but that each of the individual players hold slightly different pieces of it and so have different perspectives and different incentives. So. Payers see, for example, what comes across on claims. Finance teams see RVUs and revenue. Clinicians can be limited by what they can see outside of their own systems. And the patients hold the real key to social determinants. So in the current state, we are easily able to miss the complete picture, even though that's exactly what we are attempting to move toward with holistic value-based care models. It's a great overview. John, would you like to jump in next? Sure. Well, thanks for having this and thanks for all the panelists for, for participating here. Uh, quick background, I've been in revenue cycle for much of my career, working with most of the large health systems across the country and joined IMO Health um, about five years ago. IMO Health provides the terminology um, that powers much of the diagnosis capture across the United States of America, including in Providence and UVA Health. So essentially, the reason for visit and thus the ICD-10 codes or SNOMED codes that power downstream analytics. I mean, one of the challenges that I don't think has fundamentally changed in the healthcare delivery model is that we're still dealing with the percentage of patients that are in true BBC programs. So how do you change physician behavior when you're talking about one out of every five patients, two out of every five patients? It just feels like that balancing act of um, expecting different, maybe different care provisions or different point of view when uh, that's not the preponderance of their physician po patient population at any moment has been a continued struggle. And making that easier for those VBC programs to be executed, I still think is an objective for most of the ecosystem. Great. Great to have you here. And Kedar, are you seeing some of these same challenges and opportunities and where do you see the potential of AI and data analytics in moving yeah, forward? It's a big question, Angie. Thank you for um, <laughs> having me here and thanks for to Modern Healthcare for hosting this and to my co-panelists. It's, uh, it's a pleasure to be here. Um, I agree with what both uh, Lacey and John have said. Uh, it's, it's, there's no question that we have uh, to do good value-based care. You need better data to understand the populations that we're working with and to try to take better care of our patients. We also have a primary economic problem where most of our patients um, in our health systems today are still paid for, their care is paid for through a fee-for-service system. And, you know, at a practice level, you can't really differentiate between a, a patient who's in a value-based contract versus one that's in a, a, a fee-for-service contract. So 
you know, behavioral norms for providers don't really shift all that much in regular, in a day-to-day kind of clinic schedule or in a practice environment. I'll, I'll just also add that I think, frankly, we don't have a strong enough uh, primary care base to do really good value-based care, um, sort of as a, almost axiomatically, it depends on really strong primary care. And the truth is we have a very fragile, fragmented, inaccessible primary care system at the moment in the country. And we have, and there's, and it's that way for a good reason. We've underinvested in primary care for probably a couple of generations now. And the result of that is we have very fragmented and deeply inaccessible primary care. Um, you asked a very specific question about AI. Um, and so if, against the backdrop of the things I just said, um, I think AI has an uphill has an uphill challenge, right? There are there are, are in some ways much bigger questions around how we solve for the primary care problem, how we solve for the payment, you know, uh, dynamics between multiple different payment models operating in a clinical environment. I do think that AI tools can help us very significantly with the data issues. I think there are very significant uh, data questions that we have that would help power a more effective population health strategy and a more effective value-based care strategy. And I think that's probably where AI tools are going to be the most helpful to us, you know, helping us understand our populations more effectively, helping us predict risk uh, of of ill health, uh, and then helping us to monitor patients uh, as they go through our systems to achieve better health and care outcomes. So uh, I know we're going to get into those things a lot more, but that's my initial answer to your question. Yeah, we're definitely going to probe deeper with some of the applications of AI. Uh, but Deepak, what are your thoughts on the big challenges and opportunities and where we might see AI and data analytics applied? Yeah, uh, first of all, it's uh, great to uh, great to meet all of you, my fellow, fellow panelists. And Angie, thank you for inviting me to this. Uh, I've been with Providence for seven years. And for those of you who don't know Providence, uh, we are a large a not-for-profit health, health system based on the West Coast. We cover seven states. We serve uh, 5.2 million patients, unique patients annually. We have actually one of the largest risk pools or like the value-based care uh, populations in the country. We cover North, out, out of out of the 5.2 million patients, 1.7 are under total uh, some form of risk. 1.2 million of those are under total cost of care risk, uh, spanning over 160 unique contracts. Um, so so it's a pretty large population we work with, and so we've had to organically over the past um, few years develop the processes necessary to kind of drive successful outcomes in the, in that portfolio. So in terms of opportunities, I would frame the opportunities in three perspectives. From the perspective of a patient, I think uh, value-based care provides the best opportunity we have as an overall healthcare system to redesign our healthcare system in a patient-centric model, putting the patient at the center of all the care delivery processes. The second perspective I would offer is the is the uh, purpose uh, is the perspective of the medical practice or the care model or the care management and uh, care delivery. And I would say from that perspective, um, many of the clinicians I speak to uh, who actually practice in value based practices that are steeped in value based care uh, tell me that. Um, the, this is what they trained in medical school for like to practice in a value based care model that puts. Uh, that puts the patient first ahead of uh, ahead of uh, other consider administrative considerations in the practice. And the third, I would say, with the healthcare industry as a large uh, struggling for health sustainability from a financial standpoint, with significant financial t- situations, many of the health systems, including Providence, face. I would say uh, value-based care offers the pathway forward to drive not only a better uh, better optimization of costs, but a more financially sustainable path forward. Uh, and the second part of your question related to artificial intelligence and data, my gosh, I, I, I probably could speak the whole day about it. It's, it's a huge passion of mine. But I would say this at a high level, um, when, I, when, when you say artificial intelligence, my mind goes to there are three major classes of our, our artificial intelligence models. One is the generative model that have that have hugely gained in popularity over the recent years. There's the predictive model, which has been in use for a number of years, you know, transcending these far, these near chat GPT. 
an augmentative model that uh, you know that focuses on automation. And um, when you look across in value-based care, I would say there are four ca major categories of application, areas of applications. One is in care delivery and management. And uh, the second is in care delivery and management where you look at things like accurate documentation and coding. How do you prioritize patients for care management? Um, the second, I would say, is risk pool economics, where you know you're understanding the mechanics of the value-based care arrangement itself. Like, how do you uh, uh, predict what you have? Uh, how do you how do you get more certainty in an area where there is less information? And AI plays a huge role there. That is estimating financial benchmarks. You know, uh, you know, predicting what your utilization indicators might look like at the end of the year with only one quarter of data you know, uh, things like that. And uh, how do you predict risk, risk exposure? The third is in program administration, like things that we don't think about, but that are happening in the back end. How do you compose a care delivery network? What are the ideal uh, nodes in the network that can lead you to a successful performance outcome? Patient outreach, uh, can you create intelligence in the area in, in the back end to help your care management, limited care management staff to identify and prioritize the patients based on criteria. And, um, and um, my favorite area, which is data management and interoperability, which is highly underserved right now. And it is a wild, wild west in healthcare out there. And lastly, risk pool performance. I think we've all talked about how um, value-based care forms a small portion of the overall fee for of the of the care delivery ecosystem i tend to believe that the challenge is not the proportion itself it's one of integration it is how do you blend you cannot have value based care sitting on one corner like you know it's a pilot set of programs and you have the majority of the operations focused on fee for service the challenge is how do you blend these together and that's been a focus of a lot of our work and uh AI and uh, data has the uh, data strategies have a huge role to play there. Uh, from you know, how do you blend a, a blend a PNLs from the perspective of a regular de economic delivery operations with uh, with those of value based care as an example. And I could go on and on, but I'll pause there. But uh, that's that's my overview. Yeah, thanks for breaking that down and and touching on a lot of different areas. Um, I'll pause here actually for any reactions. And as we go through today, please feel free to jump in and react to uh, your fellow panelists. Yeah, Deepak, that was, uh, thank you for going into that. I think you, you nailed it in, in my comment was kind of how do you integrate in a predominantly fee-for-service model so that the physicians and the care providers at the front end are not feeling like these patients are isolated in this, I'm doing something differently over here. And that that takes really thoughtful data presented at the point of care in a way that is seamless to the physician to influence, whether it be a documentation expectation or a, a care a care pathway. Um, so I appreciate that, that perspective. I think some of the organizations that I've seen that have done it really well have, have made it seamless for the end, the end user on the front end. About yeah. those data elements being disparate. Um, one of our points of view at IMO is that you essentially need to semantically normalize that data to make it useful across users. So you, you have a payer who's speaking in a claims perspective. That often doesn't translate to the acuity or the definition of acuity of a, of a physician when they're looking at a patient in front of them. And that can cause a breakdown in the understanding of that risk pool. Does that resonate with this group? Like as the people feel, seem to be talking past each other versus translating the data in a way that's useful? I think that translation word, John, is really important because we often speak about being in value-based care as having a foot in both canoes. You know, we've all heard that saying, and I would almost say rather than it just being fee-for-service and then value-based care, that what we are kind of talking about is the that we have a foot in the clinical and a foot in the financial and trying to pull those two together. They're very different languages. And particularly in organizations that have seen a lot of success in fee-for-service models and shifting to, you know, taking on that risk and thinking differently about the uh, financial implications of the clinical care may actually be a new conversation for some organizations out there that can be aided by good data, facilitated by AI, et cetera. Yeah, I would say 
You know, I, I think we've all heard that foot in two canoes analogy. I think uh, I would actually say it is uh, canoes that are actually perpendicular to each other. That's kind of like the challenge that we face in some ways, because if you look at, if you think about our traditional healthcare delivery system, take a step back and think about it. We operate in like discrete swim lanes. There is like, there is a, uh, there's an emergency care department, there's acute care facilities, there's like medical groups, there is like urgent care. All of them live and die within that, that, within that narrow swim lane, right? That's how our systems are organized. And what value-based care does is, is place a horizontal across all of those swim lanes, right? Because the, the traditional swim lanes work well when resources are unlimited, when, you're, when, you're, uh, when your dollars are flowing unlimited based on the volume of services in each of the swim lane, you're great. But the moment the dollars are constrained based on, on a per member per year basis, or like you have a fixed amount of resource that you have to allocate across all of them, then you have to have what I would call a product perspective. Or in other words, healthcare delivery systems need to think like a payer, like an insurance company. They need to develop the muscles to do that. And that's why the risk pool economics sit as a horizontal across all of these. So if you ask within your delivery systems, do you know what your Medicare Advantage product, uh, you know, risk pool really looks like? What, how much, what's the amount of funding that's flowing in? What's the amount of dollars that are flowing out in terms of expenditure, whether within your own institution or outside? And how much of those dollars are really going towards care delivery versus other administrative uh, reasons, whether, wherever they may be in the system? If you cannot answer those questions, then you don't have that product perspective. And unless you have that product perspective, you cannot harmonize that with each of those swim lanes. And I think it is, it is absolutely possible. In some ways, I think the analogy of uh, one foot in each canoe is a false one because in fact, you do need those two canoes. You do need the product perspective to operate horizontally. It is normal for any other industry outside healthcare to do that where you have a product and a services uh, uh, business operating, uh, you know, ta in tandem. Uh, healthcare is just not used to that operating model. I, I really appreciate these perspectives and want to keep the mo momentum of the conversation going by getting a little bit more specific into the applications and improvements that we're seeing. So I'll, I'll field this to Kadar, but the question is, what are some successful early applications of AI or data management strategies that are making an impact in the move toward value-based care or the, the alignment of organizational priorities um, like was just laid out? Yeah, so I think there's a, uh, you know, uh, Deepak and, and has given us a way of thinking about uh, or organizing AI tools uh, a bit. One way of thinking about it is uh, supply side improvements and demand side improvements. So supply side is the provider system, demand side is the patient family community system. On the supply side, I think there are um, enhancements that are happening to how we predict failure. Um, so can we actually better target our resources to patients that are going to require more significant levels of care and attention in the future? Uh, for patients that are already in our system, can we better uh, can we optimize their care so that we can rescue them when something's going off the rails? For example, I've seen recent efforts to try to create a sepsis tool that will help us to understand a patient in the emergency room that's suffering complications related to sepsis, and can we anticipate them going further south sooner and, and, and therefore providing an earlier rescue? Uh, there are also uh, technologies that are now uh, coming into the picture that allow us to better monitor and support patients uh, throughout their longitudinal care trajectory can, uh, for example, with patients with chronic disease, that we need to help understand whether they're uh, taking their medicines, whether they're uh, coming in and out of subspecialty or primary care, uh, helping to monitor and support those patients uh, uh, in those environments. On the demand side, there are applications that are coming into the picture that help patients understand their condition more successfully, allow them to self-manage their conditions more successfully, and then ultimately understand their, their risks so that they can take uh, sort of preventive action sooner and earlier. Um, Deepak also described the kind of population level uh, tools, better risk prediction, understanding the risk pool more successfully, risk mitigation, not at the individual level uh, now, but at the whole population level. Can the system administer 
um, tools and supports to mitigate risk at a whole population level, which is going to be important for contracting and, and achieving the, the goals of value-based care, which is better health for a whole population. Um, and then the last thing I'll just say is that there's a whole bunch of uh, tools in the AI uh, universe that are really trying to optimize workflow, uh, you know, back office functionality, um, scheduling, um, getting people to come in and out of the system more successfully, uh, really movement of people and things through the system, whether it's uh, economic or, or or people. Those are the two kind of variables that I think are most being paid attention to there. And then creating ways for systems to communicate with each other. Uh, we we may, through AI tools, finally have a, a solution to, to real interoperability and having electronic systems talk to each other for the first time. We, there's still a long way off, but, uh, but that idea at least is on the horizon and we looked at today. John, tell us more about this this effort to help systems talk to each other and make the data that health systems have actionable. Lacey mentioned at the top of the conversation, there's just so much to wrap our arms around with data and healthcare. Um, and I, I feel this is a, an area of expertise for you, so I'd love to hear your thoughts. Yeah, I think a couple of themes that I, I'll pick up across everybody's mentioned. So IMO plays a role, as I mentioned, in that, that data capture at the moment of the encounter, the reason for visit being captured. I think we then most of that data flows into the patient's problem list. And if you really want a, a horizontal perspective of the patient's longitudinal care, that problem list can be a real access point for initiating uh, maybe different interventions. IMO has a perspective to try to move as much of those interventions to the left, meaning kind of from the back of the revenue cycle more to that moment of a documentation as much as possible in a seamless way to help capture better data, maybe surface information gathered from structured data in the record or from a payer's perspective, and then make that problem list more actionable, cleanse it, deduplicate it, de deprecate it where possible so that you can have an informed assessment of the patient at that moment that may be more horizontal than the intervention from a specific subspecialty. Now that doesn't mitigate the need for incentive alignment and restructuring of expectations across many care providers within a health system. But to us, without that underlying data quality, you're going to be hampered in, in making the change you want within your health system. So that's a little bit of kind of how we view the world. If you clean that up, that certainly enables more effective interoperability, whether that um, be other care partners in your network or outside of that. But that's where we start. Our point of view is improve the documentation, surface necessary information, and cleanse that problem list to make it possible. Yeah, great overview. Deepak, do you have any early applications or insights on AI application from Providence that you can share with the group? As I shared earlier, I think we've uh, uh, we've explored all of these different different models of AI. Recently, I think our our chief digital innovation officer, Sara Vazi, kind of uh, announced and, and shared, I think, with the broader industry, the, the work that our teams have done in, uh, in reducing the inbox loads for our providers by automatically uh, enabling uh, greater efficiency using AI, generative AI. Um, uh, one, of our, one of our caregiver colleagues, Dr. Abby Cunningham, has actually uh, spearheaded this initiative called MedPearl, which makes it easier for doctors to keep up to date on a lot of the medical literature that they are confronted and AI can play a huge role in that. Those are a couple of examples. On the back end, the in more areas that I work on in value-based care, um, we've, been, we've been exploring the use of AI in some use cases. Like if, if those of you who worked with value-based care arrangements in the field know that at the, at the end of every month, you're working with your payers and they'll send you things like the financial statement, they'll send you like claims data and things like that. And and if you've seen one arrangement, you've seen one arrangement, even with the same pair. And, and it's literally the wild, wild west. So we've been exploring the use of AI to actually uh, recognize patterns, you know, create an integrated financial statement and actually work with the industry to propose a standards and AI work very closely with each other. They are tied at the hip. So you, while you use artificial intelligence to eliminate some of the 
administrative, ad, some of the administrative uh, hurdles here, um, you also need to work with the industry to uh, create a path forward where those hurdles will not occur in the first place going forward and there's more streamlined uh, exchange of information. So we've been actively engaged with Da Vinci and HL7 to be able to uh, create new pathways to send data that are that are more standard in nature. We've actively used machine learning models to uh, to create what are called a leading utilization indicator program, where like you know at a population level, like Kedar was talking about, um, uh, you know we can we can actually say what our ED uh, ED utilization per thousand is going to look like at the end of uh, end of the year with like you know a quarter worth of data within a very stable confidence interval and. And our ability to predict that has been really useful for our clinicians so that they can start to take action early on in the year, even with insufficient data. Um, and so those um, those kinds of, uh, those are the things that occur to me immediately. There's a lot more <laughs> I can share. Yeah, I was going to say, Deepak, I mean, that, those are some advanced analytics for a health system and, and the alliance kind of with Providence's play there. What's your data infrastructure to enable that sort of predictive analytics uh, I mean, how, how much work have you done as an organization, maybe same to Lacey, to stand up the necessary cleansing aggregation of that data to enable those models to work? Wow, that's, uh, yeah, it's a pretty intense and uh, deliberate amount of effort for the past, I would say, at least five years or probably more than that, because it, it's one of the reasons I came into the organization is that we didn't have exposure or we didn't have a real good insight into the type of risk that we had back when I joined. And one of the key things we, we had to accomplish in my team is to pull together all the information we had about risk arrangements across and create, construct a portfolio, create the mechanics and develop the muscles to manage that portfolio better. And one of the key pillars we focused on is the data infrastructure. And the data infrastructure uh, we envisioned <clears throat> as two things. One, to be EHR agnostic and payer agnostic. So what that means is that uh, it, in, in essence, anyone who's working on value-based care arrangements knows that uh, at least uh, 20 to 30% of all your services occur occurs outside the walls of your organization. So you have to create a system that sits uh, alongside your EHR, but not integrated with your EHR that can be open to receiving data, clinical data, not only from other uh, environments um, outside your system. That's one. Second is the whole payer data relationships is, is an area that we worked on where uh, we today we process like literally thousands of claim files that come to us like every month that um, and, and along with our uh, patient rosters, care gaps information, um, you know, like our, our risk adjustment files, MMRs, MORs, all of these with like, to your point, John, like with different vocabularies, different, uh, different structures and standards, uh, they, they, come, they come into this cloud-based architecture that we've constructed that has made it significantly um, more efficient for us to aggregate all of these information and then serve that up in what we call a common population health data model that then can be used by other vendors or um, once that data is normalized, our, I have a medical economics team, an actuarial team that actually uses this to kind of uh, predict what our financial outcomes might actually be using machine learning models. Uh, so it, all that is enabled by that data infrastructure that we've yeah. been able to pull together. Lacey, I'll, I'll give you a moment to touch on that data infrastructure piece as well. But before we think through that, I'd like to hear about some of the overall AI applications that you're thinking through at UVA Health um, that then leads into the efforts to set up the right infrastructure to make that AI useful. Um, so if you can kind of touch on it that way. Sure. Um, so I would say I am learning all the time and especially from peers like are here as the other panelists. I was brought to UVA for ultimately the same reason, Deepak, that um, we were seeing pressure from the payers. Uh, we hadn't done much with value-based care yet. And I think, to be totally honest, we're probably still way behind where you all are. And we are at the point, uh, I've been with the organization for five years now, and I think we've done 10 years worth of catch-up in that time. So we are 
you know, looking to aggregate different data sources, we do benefit from the fact that all of our providers at this point are on an EPIC system. So there is not too much customization or cleaning that needs to happen from different EHRs there. But that doesn't mean that we aren't missing a significant portion of the information that would be coming from those other sources, such as claims. So we are getting some of those in and really starting to contemplate what the power of those looks like, both from, you know, to your point about things like contracting and risk management to what is actually valuable at the bedside for our providers to be able to see as they are making clinical decisions about those patients' care. So. One of the, the easiest applications is just the ambient listening technologies, being able to build into workflows the ability to capture what is relevant in those patient conversations so that we are taking the administrative burden of actually typing that in away from the providers. So that's, that's a really big one and kind of the sky is the limit as we're looking at a lot of these different things. I think we, we have a good foundation in the, you know, the claims data, et cetera, that we're getting at this point and just need to layer on the investments in some of these other things. And so Deepak, it sounds like, you know, your organization has made a lot of those investments and I'm curious to hear from you and, and maybe John about how you do that, right? How you convince folks because in these early stages of value-based care, it can be scary uh, to take on risk and feel like you have limited information to work with and convincing folks that they have to make that upfront investment in order to be able to see the return is a, a part of the challenge in this work. Yeah, and you're right on, Lacey. I think it, it's uh, when I when I go look back to like early years, like go back like five years or so, we didn't have the same level of maturity that we currently do, and we still have a long way to go. I think we're still only scratching the surface, but I can say that the, the way the way we approached it was an iterative uh, approach to building these things, right? Like uh, for us, we had to demonstrate value first in order to get attention and, and resources are very scant in healthcare environments right now. Uh, capital dollars are very sparse. Right. So the way we approached it was we started uh, everything that we hope to do in an automated manner. We, we started to narrow the scope of which arrangements we would focus on and um, and and do it manually, like with a limited amount of resource. And that's really how we started. Uh, I'll give you an example. Right. I mean, one of the um, one of the arrangements, like when I brought it, when I was brought in, we decided to to take, uh, shut down a number of risk arrangements that were kind of yielding significant losses back into the organization where they were not sustainable. One of the arrangements we kept open was our own MSSP program, right? At that point, it was yielding losses, but what we were able to do is uh, we were able to see that our, <clears throat> even with the limited amount of resource that we had, we had enough information to see that uh, we could make that risk pool sustainable if we did a couple of things. We could uh, trim the network to make sure the right aligned providers mm -hmm. and clinics are participating in there. And second, we work on total cost of care expenditure in a couple of areas that were that were kind of uh, uh, pretty much obvious at the point when we were looking at the data. And so those two uh, those two levers together gave us enough of a return on that MSSP program to attract enough attention to where the organization gave us the, uh, the, the, the ability to invest in a data infrastructure to do this in a more automated manner. So, and we argued for more data resources than human resources, right? Mm -hmm. And uh, the other thing we started to do was to take advantage. Providence has what's called a Providence Global Center. And it has its office in Hyderabad in India. And it's a Providence owned entity where caregivers of Providence actually work in Hyderabad. And we were, we've were we been able to expand significantly our data operations to operate out of that center to leverage not only cost advantages, but also resource availability in that area to be able to build an, an infrastructure of this kind. Kanar, I'd like you to touch on that as well. Um, the question Lacey asked about gaining support for these initiatives and buy-in. Yeah, I mean, you know, we, I have a, uh, in addition to my role at uh, leading the Institute for Healthcare Improvement, I, I serve on a National Academies Committee right now that's working across uh, 
many AI companies to try to establish a, a code of conduct for artificial intelligence. That's the, what the committee's called, the AI Code of Conduct Committee. Uh, and it's very interesting because I think the question that you're asking, Lacey, of how do we how do we engage in this uh, uh, value based journey? How do we convince uh, uh, our system leadership to invest more substantially in value based care, and then subsequently the technologies that might enable that um, is a strategy question. It's a it's a do you believe fundamentally that the check the trajectory that we're on as a country is towards value based care or not? Because if you don't then why would you make, you know, strategic investments in this area? The, the history is, at least from CMS and from uh, other federal entities, that uh, the trajectory has been ever more towards increasing the range of value-based care uh, models that are now available uh, with a little bit of a drawdown on Medicare Advantage in the last couple of months to year. Uh, but in the broader perspective, you know, the movement has been progressively towards more and more uh, risk arrangements of some kind and moving the risk to providers uh, fundamentally. And so uh, I think, you know, ultimately this canoe thing, you know, we've talked about this analogy already in this conversation it comes up every time you're talking about value-based care. But it, in some ways, you know, we haven't been shoved off of one boat to the other, uh, which perhaps would have been too abrupt. But uh, it is clear that there is general movement, I think, in the industry towards value-based care um, and towards greater and greater proportions of the total cost being borne by uh, by the provider, actually. So increasing the amount of total cost of care movement towards the provider. And so, uh, you know, from a, from a strategy perspective, if you're a leadership team looking at how to manage the future of your organization, not just in the next year, but in the next five or 10 years, you're, you've got to be thinking a little bit about um, how you want to make bets on information infrastructure that would allow you to to operate a value based care delivery environment. Um, so I think that's kind of the question that most systems are thinking about. And then making those investments, it, the, the sort of the fundamental for how you get involved in this is information architecture. Like that is a without information systems to understand your whole population and the costs that they're incurring and the risks that they present and what that risk pool looks like and how to how to do all the things that Deepak is describing. How do you narrow a network properly? Like without information, you, you can't really do that. Um, and so those kinds of information assets, strategic information assets are gonna be vital for us to actually do this work um, going forward. Yeah, and I would say that that's the, thank you, Kedar. I think that was very insightful. I, I would also add to that, that in addition to general belief, like philosophical agreement that we're moving towards value-based care, I think it also helps to actually show them, uh, show our delivery system leaders. And the way that we've been able to do that is actually create what we call, we have developed over the past few years, what we call a value-based care PNL uh, that actually creates a PNL model for each of these risk products. Our MSSP has a PNL, uh, Humana MA has a PNL, UHC MA has a PNL. And what we do is we, within all of these, uh, we actually estimate what the premium allocation looks like, what the net overall spending within that risk pool looks like, and what the risk pool either surplus or deficit looks like, right? And then we run that against our delivery system financials, which is, which is like our internal costs and things like that. When you combine the two is when our, you're able to have an educated conversation with your CFO. It's not just uh, whether you have to do more value-based care or not. It's more around value-based care yields and generates a yield of X uh, percent that is significantly above where, you're, where you are in fee-for-service or below. And so it, also, it does two things. It makes you, it empowers you to drive stronger contracting, uh, to make contracting decisions with your payers because you know exactly how you are, um, how much resources are flowing into every product and you can be the best advocate that you can be for your communities and your patients in that, in that negotiation. And the, and the second is, um, the, it, it enables you to uh, gain more traction within an existing delivery system environment. You see, I believe that the problem is that we've set the whole country on a journey towards value-based care without equipping them with the right type of vocabulary and the tools to actually manage it. The business of value-based care has progressed much more quicker than the infrastructure, the information infrastructure, or even the core delivery systems and processes, our finance departments. 
need a whole new area called managed care finance and, and that that actually works with uh, with these models in new ways right and yeah. we've had to create that uh, you know over the past few years um and i think teaching our healthcare delivery systems that uh, you know it is actually okay to have your foot in two canoes and you can actually create things that bind these two canoes together so you don't like fall apart when these canoes drift apart and you can actually keep them together. And here are the tools you be you have to be able to do that is actually um, probably the most practical thing to do for the next few years because it's unrealistic to expect that the entire system is going to shift into one canoe or the other. That I don't see that happening anytime in the near future. It also strikes me that, you know, as we're talking about finite resources and replacement um, that one of the benefits of these data and AI tools is that you can actually replace human manual action and you know, things like searching through charts with information at the point of care where it is needed. So um, there's also potentially a benefit when you talk about your most finite resource being the care teams and the providers, that if we can actually steer them toward the right direction then um, and replace the revenue that might be lost through things like demand destruction with appropriate utilization of care that we are looking at replacement instead of destruction and increased joy in work potentially too. Yeah, I mean, I think on that point, that's a, that's a really important point that you know, one of the, one of the major currencies of value-based care is through understanding performance of the system, right? Uh, performance measurement, quality measurement, you know, whatever outcomes measurement of some kind, that's the currency, right? We're, we're paid based on that. Your star ratings are based on that. You know, your, your reimbursement essentially is guided by that. Um, and so much of what we do, in fact, to compose those measures is exactly what you're describing, Lacey, combing through charts. We have a bunch of clinical abstractors combing through records to try to abstract a bunch of different data elements and compile the quality measures and, and outcomes measurement that then we feed to regulators and other payers, et cetera. Uh, a lot of that work uh, could be done, I think, differently with AI. Uh, and I think that's that's a thing that we're starting to see more of, and I think we'll see a lot more of in the future. But And, and by the way, most of the people that are doing that job are clinical nurses. So yeah. we have a nursing shortage, one side, the so delivery side. And we've got a whole army of nurse abstractors that are doing this other job, like coming through records and extracting yeah. quality measures. You know, so there's a there's a double potential opportunity in that um, uh, disruption. Yeah, so, and I would I would I would uh, absolutely agree. And we see this dilution of nursing capacity at the front end because of these administrative pulls. And and when you add on top of that. Uh, the other administrative needs like prior authorization, like, you know, chart pulls and chart reviews, concurrent reviews, and the, the list goes on and on to where there is a significant dilution of clinical capacity at the front end. And uh, I think technology can play a huge role in solving that. Yeah, I'll just weigh in. I'm, we're a vendor, certainly. So we have a slightly different perspective, but what grounds our, our commercial strategy is essentially, and this may play into your initial question, Lacey, is like, we need to make sure the clinical team values what we do first. And that, that, got, that grounds every bit of our product development um, back to our, our origin when we offered a terminology layer. We kind of physicians like documenting in our terminology because it was more reflective of what they learned in residency and fellowship. And the back end's like, oh my God, coding's getting better. Both teams won. But we had to in line on that physician practice first. And so that as we bring more value-based care oriented solutions to the market, we're still grounding ourselves in how's a physician going to use this? How's it going to make the, his or her or their life a little bit better? I think the AI ambient listening is a is a, a strong, it's still early in its game, but there could be really powerful ways to capture and surface data in those interactions that could be exciting. And that's a role that we want to help those ambient vendors play. Thank you all for those perspectives. This conversation is just flying by and unfortunately we only have about uh, a little less than five minutes left. So I'm going to shift to a kind of wrap up question 
which I'm sure could open many more cans of worms to to follow down the rabbit hole. But what is one piece of advice that you would want to leave with our audience today about preparing for the future of value-based care from a technology perspective? So whether that means getting your data in shape, identifying AI champions, any of the other things that we've touched upon broadly today. And I know that's hard to distill down to one piece of advice, but if you could could try. I'll go ahead and start with Kadar for this and then loop around. <laughs> All right. Uh, well, the advantage of going first is that uh, everything hasn't been said already, but uh, my goodness, I mean, my, my, I guess, first of all, I'd say uh, if you're, if you're not sure yet what the future holds for value-based care, I'd say it, despite politics being what they are, it, it is definitely here, will be here regardless of who is uh, running our country in a couple of months. Uh, so, you know, be, you know, pay attention to value-based care. It's going to matter. It's going to be a big part of the future of healthcare. Invest in it. Uh, to, to the question, the Lacey, you were asking earlier, I think invest upfront in building capability and infrastructure to actually do this work. Uh, from an AI perspective, I think, you know, start, uh, I would say start small with, you know, AI moves, is moving very, very fast and, in a lot of different directions simultaneously. So I would say uh, my, my sense is that small scale experimentation uh, in, in a controlled way in your environment is actually probably the way to go to try to understand what tools might be beneficial to your system today um, as you think about your value-based care data strategy. So, um, and good luck. That's great. Lacey, I'll field to you next. Yeah. Um, so, we have found that involving clinicians in the discussions, particularly around things like measurement, can lead to better outcomes um, because their guidance means that measures more informed by clinical best practice. They, um, we can take into account like those in vivo workflows for the capture of relevant information and because um, engagement increases when the logic and the targets are determined by themselves. So we're talking about radical change, and that is difficult, particularly in the sort of ground in um, healthcare environment. So involving those clinical teams in the governance of workflows and data reporting and even acquisition of partnerships and quality improvement processes can be really important. We're lucky that in healthcare, we are surrounded by individuals who are highly trained, they're highly intelligent, they're highly engaged and wanting to make things easier and better. So I have repeatedly been delighted to find peers and collaborators who add incredible value in addition to their uh, direct patient care with, you know, interests, experience, and training in these kinds of things. So we just have to be willing to ask, willing to learn, um, and be bold enough to take action, even when we hear things we don't like. That's a great North Star is keeping the clinician's voice front and center. John, what would be your piece of advice to leave with our audience? Yeah. Simple for me, specificity matters. So as you are building out your AI models, your data infrastructure, ensuring that you're not losing that clinical specificity on any patient interaction where appropriate would be my only counts. Building that infrastructure to capture that, building that infrastructure to leverage that into your analytic models is just, I think, the foundation you'll need because at some point, your definition of risk will need to mature. Your risk pool will need to mature. And you got to be ready. That's great advice. And something we didn't get to delve too far into is scaling and adapting. So I'm glad you're able to kind of incorporate that, that note and consideration. Deepak, last but not least, what is your advice for our audience? Yeah, I would uh, emphatically agree with uh, everything that's been said, especially I think Kedar made a, made a point right on. I think... Uh, it, it's the value-based care appears to be the one bipartisan uh, issue that has bipartisan support in today's world. Um, so I think uh, expect that this will continue. And also I love Lacey's point about keeping the voice of the clinician and the frontline caregiver at the center of this. I would also say it's been my experience that don't do AI for the sake of AI, if that makes sense. I think what you want to do is to let the business guide you to which use cases. And then a healthy litmus test is 
try and do your use cases manually first. You have a small team, small area, try and implement it manually. It unearths many of the problems that you want to be able to, your technology to solve. And then if that is generating value, then you apply your resources towards AI, especially in a resource constrained environment. Uh, I think you're going to find, especially uh, you're on the delivery system side or on the payer side, you're going to find every uh, vendor or technology partner has an AI component to their solution. So uh, how, how and what you choose uh, largely depends on what you need and, and, uh, and how, how much more impactful that'll make you. It sounds like really being thoughtful about your application. So great piece of advice. I appreciate all of your perspectives and thank you all for taking the time to share your knowledge with our audience and, and lay out the, the groundwork for how we can advance value-based care. I'd also like to give a final thank you to the sponsor of this session, IMO Health. And to those watching, thanks for tuning in. Please enjoy the rest of the virtual briefing.